Welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. This is Spirit Matters, your daily spiritual check-in. My name is Dal Grunga, and I'm so glad you're here. I'm here with my live Zoom studio audience. I'm here with you, wherever you are. And as always, thank you for being here. There's a lot of places you could be right now, and somehow you're with us. You're listening. This has found you. Whatever's meant to find you today will find you. Whatever you're meant to hear today, may it sink deep into your heart. May it not come from my lips or my mind, but may it come from some divine source through me, through other mediums through the airways and into your heart, whatever you are meant to receive. We're reading the Bhagavad Gita. We have a spiritual transmission taking place on a daily basis of spiritual sound vibration through the Bhagavad Gita. And we've been reading about sacrifice. We've been reading about sacrifice and we've been reading about goals, not my 2023 goals of my abs goals or my career goals or my relationship goals, but spiritual goals and about aligning everything in my life around my spiritual aspirations um, and making everything in my life spiritual by connecting it to uh, connecting it to those aspirations. And so talking about transformation, talking about sacrifice, um, and it's coming up in the context of the fourth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna is talking about how to act in, the, how to how to be in this world, but not of it, how to be in this world, but not of it, how to move through this world without getting lost within it, how to um, perform actions without getting uh, tangled into the attachment of of holding on to the results of things and thinking that it's supposed to go a certain way because it's all about me but actually being relieved from that burden of anxiety of having to control the outcomes because I'm surrendering everything to something higher. So uh, we're in this section of the Bhagavad Gita, fourth chapter. We were reading 25 yesterday, I think. So I'm going to read a few verses, and then we're going to get to verse 30. And then we're going to pause on verse 30, because what we find is that Different people offer sacrifice in different ways. What's an austerity for one person may not be an austerity for somebody else. And so our particular brand of sacrifice that we experience in the world, and we use sacrifice, think of sacrifice and use in terms of, of, of things that we let go of in order to elevate ourselves beyond our current circumstance. So sacrifice means I'm going to let go of something that I've been holding on to, whether it be a physical thing or whether it be an idea or whether it be a thought or whether it be a feeling or a grudge or whether it be um, anything that I'm feeling some sense of attachment to that I think is mine that's actually holding me down. Learning to let go of the things that hold me down. Um, and so sacrifice initially feels counterintuitive because I've identified with those things so deeply that I think they've become a part of me. And so to let go of it feels like a part of me is dying, which is true, but it's a false self and it's a part that needs to die and it's a part that's holding me down. And so when I learn to let that go, I actually can elevate myself into a new into a new way of looking at myself in the world. And so Krishna talks about, and different phases of life may have different types of sacrifices. Different periods of my life have different types of sacrifices. And so whatever phase of life we're in right now, we owe it to ourselves to think, what does sacrifice look like for me today? What part of my ego am I trying to shed and let go of? What are the things that I'm attached to today that maybe I wasn't attached to 10 years ago, and maybe I may not be attached to 10 years from now, but it's something right now for me. And it, and it may not even be, it's like not even an age thing. Like I'm 38 years old. It doesn't mean that everyone who's 38 years old is trying to go through the same types of ego shedding that I'm going specifically. There's age, there's, there's, there's social circumstances, there's family backgrounds. And it's not even, this isn't our first rodeo where I'm coming from in my previous lives and how it's bringing me to right now. So I don't need to compare myself to other people, but I should understand that growth looks different today than it did 10 years ago, than it will 10 years from now, and that it does from somebody else who may be sit, sitting, <coughs> excuse me, maybe sitting right next to me. 
And so what does growth look like for me right now, today, in this phase of life, in these current circumstances? And when I embrace a spiritual mindset, I can ask that question regularly. What does growth look like for me right now? Things aren't going my way. What does growth look like for me right now? Things are going, everything's going my way. Blessings are raining from the heavens. What does growth look like for me right now? So that I don't get carried away and, and think that this is all mine and this is all my doing and fall into the ego trap again. That it will just set me up for, um, set me up for stumbling over myself into the future. Blessings come into my life and everything is a blessing we can say, but the, things that we stereotypically think as blessings, the good things um, fall my way. How can I use this for growth? Things don't go my way. The undercover blessings are showering from the heavens. How can I use this for my growth? So that's a powerful question that we can bring into our life. And so Krishna is talking about different types of, of yogis and people that perform sacrifice. Yesterday we read Verse 25, fourth chapter, some yogis perfectly worship the demigods by offering different sacrifices to them. And some offer sacrifices in the fire of the Supreme Brahman. So basically uh, uh, offering things to people for material benefit. You've got something I want, so I'm going to serve you for it. Um, some, the unadulterated brahmachari, sacrifice the hearing process and the senses in the fire of mental control. And others, the regulated householders, sacrifice the object of the senses in the fire of the senses. Others who are interested in achieving self-realization through control of the mind and senses offer the function of all the senses and of the life breath as oblations in the fire of the controlled mind. Having accepted strict vows, some become enlightened by sacrificing their possessions and others by performing severe austerities, by practicing the yoga of eightfold mysticism or by studying the Vedas to advance and transcend the knowledge. Still others who are inclined to the process of breath restraint to remain entranced, practice by offering the movement of the outgoing breath into the incoming and the incoming breath into the outgoing and thus at last remain entranced, stopping all breathing. Others curtailing the eating process offer the outgoing breath into itself as a sacrifice. And this is the verse I wanted to pause and look at, text 30. All these performers who know the meaning of sacrifice become cleansed of sinful reactions and having tasted the nectar of the results of their sacrifices, they advance toward the supreme eternal atmosphere. Report, commentary. From the foregoing explanation of different types of sacrifice, namely the sacrifice of one's possession. So that's one type of sacrifice. I want to I want to give in charity the things that I have in order to release the grip that my things have on me. I own things, but I don't want to be owned by them. So how do I release that grip that my things have over me? I give things away in charity. I become generous. I become charitable so that I, I don't feel a slave to the things that I own. Study of the Vedas or philosophical doctrines, I'm going to offer my intellect. I'm going to offer my mind in sacrifice. That there's a lot of things I could absorb my mind in. I'm going to create a, I'm going to, I'm going to create a sacrifice by choosing to absorb my mind in spiritual subject matters and literatures. There's all kinds of things I'd like to read or watch or scroll through. It's a sacrifice to harness the power of the mind and direct it in a particular way. And performance of the yoga system. So I talked about breath and meditation and austerity of, 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 of the senses. So these different types of sacrifices, according to our natures, according to our phases of life. It is found that the common aim of all is to control the senses. Sense gratification is the root cause of material existence. Therefore, unless and until one is situated on a platform, apart from sense gratification, there is no chance of being elevated to the eternal platform of full knowledge, full bliss, and full life. This platform is in the eternal atmosphere, a Brahman atmosphere. All the above mentioned sacrifices help one to become cleansed of the sinful reactions of material existence. And we use this word sinful reactions of material existence is that we can go back and remember that the definition between real and unreal that Krishna gives in the Bhagavad Gita is that which is true and false, is that which is eternal, that which is temporary, that which brings me closer to my real self, or that which 
brings me to an illusory sense of self that is not real or eternal. And so when we talk about sinful reactions of material existence, he's talking about those activities that reinforce material mindset that reinforce my identity as something other than an eternal spirit soul. And so these, the idea of living a disciplined and regulated life in spirituality is to recognize that if I'm not careful, my mind and senses will drag me all over the universe. My mind and senses will drag me all over the universe like wild horses that are untamed. But if I learn to harness the power of my mind and my senses and direct them intentionally where I want them to go, then I'm sitting in the driver's seat and I can really start to make spiritual advancement. By this advancement in life, the commentary continues, not only does one become happy and opulent in this life, but also at the end, they enter into the eternal kingdom of God, either merging into the impersonal Brahman or associating with the supreme personality, Godhead, Krishna. Next verse, we'll just keep on reading. Verse 4, 31. Oh, best of the Kuru dynasty, Krishna speaking to Arjuna. Without sacrifice, one can never live happily on this planet or in this life. What then of the next? Commentary. Whatever form of material existence one is in, one is invariably ignorant of their real situation. In other words, existence in the material world is due to the multiple reactions of our sinful lives. Again, this word sinful lives being used in the context of living a life that is covering my real identity rather than discovering my real identity. So activities that take me away from truth, activities that reinforce a false sense of identity rather than a real sense of identity. And so whatever form of material existence we're in, we become ignorant of our real situation, that I'm an eternal spirit soul covered by matter. Ignorance is the cause of sinful life. And sinful life is the cause of one's dragging on in material existence. Because I don't understand. I don't understand what actually nourishes me. Every single person in the universe is self-interested. Spiritualists are self interested you're self-interested it's why you're listening to this podcast right now because you think maybe there's something in here that's helpful it's why we do anything we're driven by an inherent sense of self-interest but we're ignorant to what is the nature of the self and what is in my best interest spirituality is a process of discovering simply what's in my best interest commentary goes on the human form of life is the only loophole by which one may get out of this entanglement. Why? Because it allows us the opportunity to come out of ignorance. It gives us a, an intellectual faculty to come out of ignorance. Commentary goes on. The Vedas therefore give us a chance for escape by pointing out the paths of religion, economic comfort, regulated sense gratification, and at last the means to get out of the miserable condition entirely. The path of religion are the different kinds of sacrifice recommended above automatically solve our economic problems. By performing of yagya, we can have enough food, enough milk, etc. Even if there is a so-called increase of population, when the body is fully supplied, naturally the stage is to satisfy the senses. The Vedas prescribe, therefore, sacred... Uh, he says, the Vedas prescribe, therefore, sacred marriage for regulated sense gratification. Thereby, one is gradually elevated to the platform of release from material bondage and the highest perfection of liberated life is to associate with the Supreme Lord. Perfection is achieved by performance of yagya, sacrifice, as described above. Now, if a person is not inclined to perform yagya according to the Vedas, how can they expect a happy life even in this body? And what to speak of another body or another planet? There are different grades of material comforts in different heavenly planets. And in all cases, there is immense happiness for persons engaged in different types of yagya. But the highest kind of happiness that one can achieve is to be promoted to the spiritual planets by practice of Krishna consciousness. A life of Krishna consciousness is therefore the solution to all the problems of material existence. Mm. 
we've talked about this a little bit, the idea of religion devoid of substance becomes empty ritual. Um, in every stage of life, he talks over here about the idea of, of sacred marriage. There's actually, there's actually a book, I think, called Sacred Marriage um, that I read early on in, in, my own, in my own relationship about the idea of, of marriage. They weren't using it in this context, but being an ashram, we even use in, in, in um, Sanskrit vocabulary, grihasta ashram. Brahmachari ashram means being a monk. <laughs> Excuse me. We do this live, so we don't edit any of that stuff out. <laughs> Brahmachari ashram, meaning we talk about staying in the ashram, a place of shelter. And grihasta ashram, grihasta means uh, household life. How do I make it into an ashram, a place of shelter, a sacred spiritual um, way of life? Is that I recognize idam krishna idam namama. This is for Krishna, it's not for me. My marriage, my family, my career, whatever it may be, it's not for Krishna, it's for me. And how can I recognize that this is a facility, whatever it might be, facility for me to grow spiritually through the process of sacrifice? It's a way for me to give back and offer service, whether it's to another person, um, to a community, um, in any way, shape, or form. And so this process Prabhupada's mentioning here in the purport of Yagya, and it was very prominent in the third chapter also, this process of learning to detach ourselves from the things that we've identified with so deeply in the material world by learning this art of sacrifice, of giving back, of being able to live a life of service so that I start to retrain my mind to think less that it's all about me and I'm in the center towards there's something greater than myself that I'm a part of that I want to serve and in order to reinforce a mindset that I'm not my material body, but I'm an eternal spirit soul connected to the divine source, which I'm putting at the center. So these are all the verses that are being read here in this concept. And um, it's important for us as we perform our spiritual practices to remind ourselves, what is the mindset that I'm trying to in, in imbibe as a result of these practices because if i'm just going through the motions every day without without meditating on the transformation of my character and and the reframing of the way i look at myself and the way i look at god and the way i look at other people and the way i look at the world then what makes what makes my activity spiritual <clears throat> It's not the thing itself. It's not the time that I wake up. It's not the color of my bead bag or the size of my japa mala or my the 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 fabric of my yoga mat or the 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 sustainability of my yoga pants or my you know whatever it might be. The size of my altar at home. Those aren't the things that make it spiritual. What makes it spiritual is the intention behind it to sacrifice my ego in order to reframe the way I look at myself, other people, and develop a, a relationship with God based on love and service. And if I bring that into anything in my life, it becomes a spiritual activity. And so Krishna is reinforcing this here because he wants to bring Arjuna into a mindset that Arjuna was at the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita and he was bewildered. And Krishna is saying, I'm not going to change your circumstances, by the way. <laughs> I'm not going to change the circumstances, but I do want to change your mindset. I do want to change the way you approach your circumstances. And so that's what we're being called to do. That's what we're being, is being described here in the third and fourth chapter. We're talking about the ideas of karma and action and detachment and sacrifice and moving through the world, but not being of the world so that I can learn to approach any situation in life from a spiritual mindset and to be able to bring love and devotion into every aspect of my life in a mood of wanting to shed the layers of my ego so that I can uncover the true sense of self that is shining beneath all the rubble and connect that divine self of mine to the divine higher self of Krishna. And then I can take that and allow that to shine at every other aspect of my life. And what did Rumi say? After so many of the years, the sun never said you owe me. And what do you get from a love like that? 
it lights up the world. <laughs> All right, Krishna, thank you so much. We're going to turn over to Kimberly now, who is our, I like that was a nice little Mr. Rogers ending for us. Um, we're going to turn over to Kimberly, who's got some takeaways for us. And uh, she's going to share with us and then we'll, we'll, we'll walk away and take our little, take whatever we, we got home with us. What you got for us, Kimberly? All right. Today we're walking away to let go of the things that hold you down. Whether things go or don't go our way, growth is possible. Don't be owned by things. Sit in the driver's seat of your mind and senses. Um, uncover your true identity and discover what is in your best interest. And this is not for me. This is all for Krishna. Thank you. Appreciate it so much. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, that's what I'm walking away with. That's what I'm walking away with. How do I not make my spiritual practice something that I do for 10 minutes in the morning or an hour in the morning or before bed? But how can I make every moment of my life a spiritual practice? by remembering that I can sacrifice my ego in this moment by inviting in a new mindset that I'm not in the center. I want to put Krishna in the center and I want to, I want to give myself and love to this moment by opening my heart to how can I serve in this moment? Hmm. That's my takeaway. And I love you guys all so much. Thank you for being here. If it's your first time listening, welcome to the family. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you can join us again. If you're a regular listener, God bless you. I have no idea how many of you are out there. I don't even know the analytics of how many people are listening. It could be one, 10, 100, a million, probably not a million, but however many are out there, thank you for being here. Uh, we love you. We're grateful for you and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care, everybody. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.